I've, I titled my talk 3D Scans in the Wild. Um, so linking it to kind of crowdsourcing, I wanted to look at um, the, the other side of um, that concept. So once you've got lots of people to help you make 3D scans, uh, what, what happens to them and what do people do with them? So um, I'll look at a few uh, examples of what people have done with them. But first, thanks for MicroPass for having me along and for, for doing such a, a great job of just adding some life to something that I feel like is going to become more and more prevalent in, in museums. Um, I'll talk more about other museums. I, I began um, getting into this work um, while I was at the British Museum um, and with uh, a colleague of mine, Alex, who's sat right there, um, in a very short amount of time um, and with zero budget, in three weeks we, we um, did some scanning and organised a, a partnership with Sketchfab to put 14 objects from the British Museum's collection uh, online uh, for people to download. Um, and that's in itself uh, has been a point of interest in that it's the British Museum giving uh, content to people for free and these are historic objects. Um, so that was an interesting thing. And the other interesting thing uh, for me is putting objects on a platform uh, where people can comment on them and add information to them from the other side of um, the, I guess, the relationship between the public and a museum. Often it's very much one way. The museum will tell people what things are, and we accept that. But if you allow people to comment on things, uh, what can they add? What stories can they add, whether they're from the country of origin of an object or from the culture of origin? Um, I think it opens up a nice kind of um, platform for dialogue. And there's not actually anywhere on the British Museum site that I believe you can comment on things as such. I mean, th there are blog posts, obviously. But to link it to an actual object, I find quite interesting. So um, I want to talk a little bit about what happened once those objects were put, put online. So my background is in uh, design um, and, uh, well, music as well. but particularly here, I've been getting into this 3D scanning thing because it just seems like an incredibly interesting and new thing that a lot of people are excited about. Um, but at the same time, people aren't necessarily, and institutions aren't sure what you can do with it. What's the point of this? And I'm looking forward to, to hearing um, from, from the people speaking, like Oliver and, and Jordan, about where they're, they're, the research they're doing in, in the uses. So I'll just um, skip through a few things that I've seen and I would love to hear from anyone if you have any other things that, that you've seen because I think it's uh, such a, a, a new thing that, it, that it's, it's nice to find what other people are doing. Um, so I kind of got into it in a big way. This is, this is my own profile. I mean, this is crazy. The, the funny thing about these models is they were made with, with 1-2-3-D catch. So some of you may be familiar with this, an app on your phone that you can make these. And the quality of these models compared to the MicroPass models is incredibly low, yet, um, as I'll show you in a moment, there, there's kind of been a lot of engagement with this collection because of it being the British Museum's collection. Um, so personally, I've kind of got a, a bit obsessed and um, I'm doing, I didn't 3D scan a tortoise, that's a, a model that I made, but um, going on to, to kind of creating other 3D models, um, I feel like this is such an engaging way of presenting historical objects. Um, and there's a few um, processes apart from photogrammetry that are quite interesting and easy to use that possibly people might be able to use to engage with the collections. Um, and please talk to me afterwards and I'll, I'll be happy to point you in the direction of those things. So, the British Museum's uh, Sketchfab is now the most followed Sketchfab profile, which is um, a nice thing, but in a way it's probably just because it's a British Museum, because the British Museum is so well known, um, and people were kind of quite surprised that they were, they were giving away things for free. That's probably why it's the most popular, not necessarily, as I say, because of the quality of the, the items that are being displayed. So it's had lots of views, it had lots of likes, and, and lots of downloads. Um, and for me, this kind of just shows that there's an appetite out there for the content that um, projects like MicroPass are producing. And I'll, I'll show you sort of some places that I've seen these downloads going. But the truth be told, who knows where they went? I mean, is it people downloading them for the, their own personal use or for research use or um, for, for other things? Um, 
but it, it's nice to know that people, like I say, are excited about this kind of thing. They're, they're interested in this kind of thing from an academic side of, thing, uh, side of things and uh, other ways too. Um, so after they were put online, there was lots of who are in, in various publications around kind of um, historic objects being freely downloadable and um, there was lots of the phrase print, print a priceless artifact and things like that. Um, so you're releasing things from your care as an institution, say the British Museum, um, to completely random people and completely open. Um, which is the, one of the best things uh, about doing this is that it's, it's about releasing that control. And also, I feel that you don't even need to worry about people doing strange and weird things, which is often a reason for not releasing, uh, say, images and things. Is you might worry that people won't respect these things. But generally, I think people do. Um, and uh, they come up with uh, amazing and interesting ideas. Um, and also, you, you engage audiences you might not normally um, engage. This is a, a video, I don't know if you follow Nerd Alert on YouTube, but um, they did a, um, a video particularly about this. And this is an American, uh, I guess, tech uh, YouTube channel. So they're talking about um, the British Museum and historic objects in relation to 3D printing. And uh, that to me is, a, is, I would assume, an audience that might, might not normally be following what the British Museum is doing. So it's a great way to um, get something that engage people, re-engage people with things like history outside of uh, an academic context, um, which I think is, is, is a really great thing. And it's definitely, it's definitely worked for me personally. I feel like I've got way more into thinking about an object and what it means and its um, potential uses than I ever would have had I not discovered photogrammetry. So again, when it comes to uh, crowdsourcing, it's also crowdsourcing the use of these things. Um, so another place uh, your, your 3D scans might end up uh, is some, something like this site called Yobi3D, which is a 3D file aggregator. And there are a few of these sites. Um, so you can see uh, there's Micropast's 3D files, and there's British Museum uh, files there as well. They're somewhat decontextualized in that you don't get the information about what they are. But what's nice is that um, these, all, these sites link back to where they came from normally. So it will link back to your Sketchfab profile. Um, so it's not like they're saying, these are our 3D objects. They're actually just um, amassing. You can search for anything. You could search for, um, I don't know, egg, and you'd find thousands of egg 3D files. So this is, uh, I assume, people looking for 3D objects for their video games, for their um, animations, for all kinds of things. Again, it's people that might not be used to um, engaging with museums as a place for these type, types of media. And now there's more and more, of, more and more museums doing 3D things. And hopefully there'll be more and more of these objects turning up in interesting places. I don't like TV shows or computer games, like I say. Um, I think time will tell. Like, it, it, like I say, it's very, very new. So uh, hopefully we'll see more and more people using them. Um, this um, is a lady called Jane. Um, Jane Ellery's Nacro, I think I'm saying that right. Um, she contacted me. Um, she's uh, used to be a researcher at York University, or rather she still is, but she's based in Australia now. And uh, what she's holding there is uh, a 3D print of a scan I made when I was on a little holiday up in Edinburgh from the National Museum of Scotland. And she was doing some research into um, the, I can't long be able to say this, pedagogical applications of 3D printing, so using 3D prints in the classroom. Um, and what's, what's nice about that is that it's gone from being in a Scottish museum to being in a classroom in Australia. That's quite a cool thing, I think, that um, you wouldn't be able to take that um, from the museum, or you could, maybe it would take a lot of you know, wrangling. But um, it's, it's nice that uh, a hobbyist, so like I say, I've been getting into doing this, a hobbyist's content is becoming useful to an academic context. That's the other side of it, is that um, as well as 
projects like MicroPass, there are people just doing this for fun. There are people that, in the same way that you would go on holiday and snap a picture of a beach, there's saddos like me that are taking like 200 pictures of like this one object because, because I think it's really, really interesting and um, I get quite into it. Um, moving on, um, lots of people 3D printed these um, objects that were released um, for different reasons, but I'm sure everyone's got their own story about why they've printed it or why they chose that object. Um, and hopefully the, the, you know, the British Museum other museums will release more of their content to these new uses and very personal uses. This idea that you could print it off and put it on your desk or um, give it as a gift or, I don't know, you could even, um, well, I'll come to this. I won't, I won't spoil uh, the surprise about a project that I'm working on at the moment, which is quite interesting. This is great. This is, uh, someone made a virtual museum of just loads of stuff, not just British, these are from the British Museum's profile on Sketchfab, but they've um, added, <laughs> they've, they've just added everything they could possibly find into this museum. So it's got that kind of second life look, and there's not too much kind of extra information about these objects. Um, but this is a company that has, has created this, uh, this is in your browser, so you can go and visit this, this URL. I think you have to do it in Safari. Um, and to get that work. I don't know how much time I'm taking up. Is anyone? Five minutes. Cool. Um, so, that, so hopefully that would reach, reach some, another audience, another audience that might not normally um, get involved with this. But again, it's using uh, new technologies to disseminate this. Uh, at least in this sense, you're, you're, you're disseminating the information about how these things look. And it's in the context of a cultural institution online. Um, where else? Um, this was a, a, a website I found called 3 Scape Me, which do um, virtual tours of different places. So here we are in Egypt, and uh, lo and behold, uh, I discovered that they also had um, found the content online and created an experience around that object. Um, so I, I could see this working really well with a lot of MicroPasts um, 3D models in, in that there's similar virtual experiences, educational experiences that can be created around these um, crowdsourced objects. And like I say, please do tell me if, if you um, think of anything else or have heard of anything else. Um, the last 10 days, this is where I was this morning, um, I've been at Somerset House um, with a few other people and we've actually been doing a project called the Small Museum. And the small museum is a kind of combination of two different projects. It's, it's the idea of being able to open a museum in a very small space with uh, non-academic staff, but to uh, every day create a new exhibition and do something new around a collection. And we, ha we used a, a small 3D printed collection. These 3D prints um, are, are, were printed uh, through Scan the World. If, if you don't know that, it's a project that's a subsidiary of iMaker. Um, and they have print-ready 3D files. So that's why we jumped on, on, on those particular models. There are a, a range of um, objects from around the world. And we wanted to look at what you can do with these 3D printed objects that would come from um, these online files that people are, are downloading. And um, I'm really interested to hear from the guys that think C3D, am I saying that right? Is that the right way around? Yes. <laughs> um, about, about kind of how, what they're using, because they, they, we found that there was a lot missing from these 3D prints in terms of the color of things and, and the sense. Part of, part of the project was researching what do people think about these objects. And um, again, Ol Oliver and, and Jordan's work will, will be really interesting to, to hear what, what they're discovering about what people think of these things. So we had a, a table, these, these brown paper sheets, every day we would roll out a brown paper sheet on, on the table, um, that, that table that you can see under there, and um, look at what you could do with an object. So we'd look some days at all of the collection and then we'd look at um, other days at a particular object um, in focus. And um, what, what did we end up doing? Um, some of you might know about near-field communication. So this was using a little chip in a sticker, um, adding it to these objects, and then the, the green circuit board there is a reader 
um, when you placed an object on this reader, it would start reading you information about that particular object. So that's something you could obviously imagine in a museum. We kind of envisage, envisage it being part of this museum in a box, that you could have a box of objects, and this box would just tell you everything that you, you would want to know about these objects or connect you with that information. Um, other interactions, um, virtual reality interactions. Um, you might have seen these kind of, you stick your phone in here and you can then kind of get a 3D impression of an object. Um, so we were also looking at that. We're, again, these 3D models, you could look at any of um, Micropass models online in kind of 3D, which is quite cool. Um, as well as virtual reality, we looked at um, augmented reality. This is using uh, an app called Augment to um, get the information of scale. It will come, hopefully it will, yeah, you can see a bit better there. So we, we have this picture that's used as a, a sort of target to project uh, on your iPad uh, a, a fairly accurate scale of this colossal marble foot from the British Museum. So the actual print we had was maybe this big, so you don't know how big that is. You can, you can tell someone how big it is, but to actually see it um, on a table in front of you gives you a, a, a better idea, I think. Um, so the small museum, we even had a visitor's book, and this was a nice comment someone, someone left. I learned more here than in the British Museum. And I, I don't mean to, 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 to bash the British Museum, but because we were such a small institution, we could spend time with people. They came in, we could give them a whole tour in about 10 minutes, and they could ask questions directly to us about these kind of things. So we realized that um, with 3D printing and 3D scanning, you've practically got an instant museum that you could open anywhere, anytime. Um, and people responded to it very well. We've been at Somerset House for 10 days. Today was the last day. We had members of the public, we had museum professionals, we had people that work in um, technology areas to help us as well. Um, people are interested in it, I think. Um, and quickly, I'll just run through one minute. Okay, one minute to take you quickly through this story. This is, this is, I just want to give you a, a nice story about what, what a 3D printed object could be. In um, 1868, Hoa Hakanaya, Easter Island statue, was picked up, sailed back from Rapa Nui to London by a bunch of sailors on the ship Topaz. And it, it got put in the British Museum where it sits uh, today. I went around, scanned this object, you know, it was, uh, all its information was pulled to pieces, its colors and everything were, were, were ripped apart and it was, it was kind of reconstructed in a digital realm. And then searching on Twitter for, for British Museum 3D, which I do quite a bit because I'm interested to see what people are doing, found that someone in Texas had printed off a giant um, version. This is quite big for a 3D print. Um, and I was asking them, well, you know, what's this for? Um, and th they turned out that they were a, um, a, a 3D printing startup from Chile who had printed this off to take to South by Southwest in Austin, Texas. So there's this nice round circle of uh, a Chilean um, culture using, creating these objects as symbols uh, of something, it getting brought to the museum, and then through 3D scanning, it becoming a symbol again for, for the same uh, country and culture. And there's uh, Jimmy Kimmel holding it, which I thought was quite cool. I was like, that's about as close as I'm gonna get to a famous person is there holding a 3D print of, of something that I scanned. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of links, because it's not by any means the first time the British Museum or any museum's done 3D printing or let people do stuff with it. So um, I'll put this up online, because these are all interesting links to, uh, to follow um, and see what other people are doing. Thank you.